Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Business Advantage TV podcast, which just might once again be the 21 Hats podcast. More about that soon, I hope. Meanwhile, I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, six months into the pandemic, Paul Downs, Jay Goltz, and William Vanderblumen take inventory. What does the crisis mean for the future of their businesses? Has it changed them as leaders? Has it affected their relationships with their employees? As you'll hear, they come to some counterintuitive conclusions. For one, William tells us that he suspects he may one day look back on the crisis and conclude that it was the best thing that could have happened to his business. It has been painful, he says, but in some ways we needed a jolt and this gave it to us. Jay says he understands. When things get really bad like this, we start paying attention to stuff that we should have been paying attention to before. Plus, do the three owners have a plan for how their businesses would operate if they were incapacitated by COVID? Even in good times, owning and running a business can be a lonely pursuit. Our hope is that these weekly conversations will, if nothing else, let owners know they are not alone in facing these challenges. This week's lineup features Paul Downs, who is founder and CEO of Paul Downs Cabinet Makers, which is based outside of Philadelphia and makes custom conference tables. Jay Goltz, whose companies in Chicago include a picture frame business, artist frame service, and a home furnishing store, Jason Home. And William Vanderblumen, who is CEO of Vanderblumen Search Group, a recruiting firm based in Houston that works with churches and other faith-based organizations. The episode is titled, When's This Gonna Be Over? William, I'd like to start with you. Last time we spoke, I think you were about to launch a new business. Did that happen? How'd it go? It did, and it's gone uh, better than we expected. So we do executive search, which whether it's a church or a school or a relief organization, it's essentially the C-suite of an organization we help them find. Uh, but when you get to middle management, the, the process and what we do really is not worth the money. But we have lots of clients that need middle management stuff fixed and solved and staffed. So we kicked it around a number of different ways over the years and COVID finally accelerated our process. And uh, what we've been working on for a long time got sped up in March and April so that we could open as churches and schools and businesses started to reopen in the fall. So we went into it uh, with realistic expectations and we're only uh, not quite a month in and we've beaten everything we thought we'd do this quarter. So it's good. Did you have to invest a significant amount of money to launch this business? Not as much as you'd think. I mean, if you if you if you're talking about money, like writing checks out of your account, not a whole lot. I mean, there was some. Uh, we don't we don't have a supply chain now in human capital and in uh, wages paid to people to set it up in central office services. Yeah, we paid for that, but but that was where COVID sped things up. Rather than fire people that didn't have a whole lot to do in March or April, we put them to work serving churches and then starting this new company. Well, while we're waiting on things to get going again, let's get, let's go ahead and build the framework we hadn't had time to build. And so the, the costs were hidden costs or soft costs. So they were there, but in terms of, did I have to go invest a bunch of my capital back into the business to get it going? It was not uh, as large as you might think. So you're talking about some reallocation of resources. Uh, well, yeah, to I mean, some I degree, so, Jay, I guess so, but you've started businesses. So, you know, Nobody knows the saying, a penny saved is a penny earned more than an entrepreneur. Nobody. So like I very easily could have laid off five or six people in March that I didn't need had we not started this company. I kept them. I paid their wages so that they could do something that didn't generate any revenue, just got an infrastructure built for a new company that may or may not work. And the gamble was in those costs that that could have been a penny saved or a lot of pennies saved or a lot of pennies earned. So that may sound like a, a spinster way of dealing with it, but the costs were there. They were just soft and uh, uh, not as prevalent as I got to go take out a loan to buy a building or a new warehouse or some of the things that you might encounter, Jay. I think the lesson from that and from what I'm dealing with is 
I believe that at some point you got to get off of defense and get back on offense because you can't stay in defense forever. And I see businesses all around Chicago that I believe are slowly but surely putting themselves out of business because they're still in panic mode. Stop spending money. Stupid stuff like the ice cream yeah. shop on a major street that has a that has a uh, awning outside that's just ripped to shred that looks yeah. horrible. And you say to yeah. yourself, really, for 800 bucks, you can look like you're you're back in business and instead you're sending out the impression that yeah we're circling the drain it's it's not yeah. good that's very much the attitude we took jay it was uh in, in our industry or our little micro niche of the search industry there are very few people that try and do what we do and they they don't use the same approach i don't think they're nice people but i don't think they do it very well and we determined you know if the, the industry will probably survive but it's going to be uh who's going to be the last man standing at the end of this. So we were like, you know what, rather than go into hide in our cave mode, we're going to come out swinging. And if we die, we die with our boots on. William, when you say it's doing better than you anticipated, uh, are you referring to re revenue? Is it? Yes. Real, real dollars in the bank are already better than we projected through the end of the year. And, and what are your uh, ambitions for the business? Do you think this could be as big a business as your uh, executive search or what are you thinking? You know, that is a great question, Lauren. It's like, you know, exec search, it's like I've owned a Lexus dealership for 12 years and we've got a lot of people. It's not a Bentley, but it's a Lexus and we've got a lot of people that are very happy with that. And now I own a Toyota dealership as well. And so, you know, you and I were together couple years ago at, at the Ford factory where the Model T was invented. And that's when Ford started making his money. It was when he got a car everybody could afford. So maybe that'll be what happens. It would have to be a whole lot of volume to surpass what we're doing with exec search. And, it, and it's two different, two different value propositions. You, you name the leader of an organization, you can't impact an organization deeper than that. But if he doesn't have the rank and file middle management support staff to get a, a team put together, then they can't execute the vision they have. So it's just two different, two different value propositions. Do any of you feel as though you've been changed as a leader uh, by the crisis we've gone through? Uh, I feel that I was a much better leader going into the crisis. So the crisis has been changed by my leadership ability. I'm not sure I follow. In other words, yeah, in 2008, when, when my world fell apart, I was barely equipped to handle it. And in 2020, when this thing arrives, I feel so much better equipped to handle a crisis that the crisis itself doesn't feel that the same, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Fact. There's that old phrase, a smooth seas make poor, a smooth seas make a poor sailor. And the fact is when you've been through stuff like this, 08 was horrendous, as you said. And I feel the exact same way. I have been handling this whole thing a whole lot better than I would have handled it 20 years ago. I think it's been, uh, and, and I'll, I may kick myself for saying this, Lauren, but I think one day I will look back at this and say, that's the best thing that could happen to me because it got me out of managing a company role and got me back into, Hey, we need to act like a startup and we need to rethink everything. And we need to, and, and it, 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 our agility is better than it was. Um, it's not without pain. I don't want to sound Pollyannish, but, but in some ways we needed a jolt and this gave it to us. Were you aware that you needed a jolt? Uh, maybe N not as aware. How's that? I mean, I, I knew we weren't in startup mode anymore, but I'd forgotten how nice it is to have the agility of startup mode. It's not, it's not sustainable forever. I mean, that doesn't work and I want a sustainable business, but, but to have that, uh, and we weren't shrinking, but to have that sort of forced acceleration has, has really, um, gotten us it's it's like we've hit rewind on our agility to a to a place when we were much leaner and faster there's another good saying the sight of the guillotine helps sharpens a man's mind <laughs> so when things get really bad like this we start paying attention to stuff that we should have been paying attention to before so i agree william i think you told us uh maybe months ago that you were rethinking how you use commercial space that uh you had moved into your offices fairly recently but uh you had a subtenant and you were thinking you might uh, give up the space is that part of the agility that you're referring to now 
We certainly explored that. And just to quickly reframe that, um, we had enough space for our whole staff to be here. Then we decided we were going to decentralize our offices all pre-COVID. And we were going to open regional offices in major metro areas where we have a lot of business. All set to do that, framed up. We'd already put in the offer for Orange County and hired the guy. And this was a week before COVID. So we, we were de- we were scaling down the headcount here in Houston at the central office. So when COVID hit and we all had to go remote for quite a while, uh, you know, obviously you revisit the question, well, do we need any space at all? Or can we do this all remotely? And I, I wish the answer were, yes, we can do it all remotely. I'd rather have that rent money in my pocket. But I think the, the conclusion is, is even further reinforced that people work better together for our type of business. Not true for everybody, but for our type of business, our central office is going to do better together. Do we need a A plus rated space and do we need as much? No. And if, if our subtenants, which are growing quickly because they're in energy efficiency, uh, if, if they end up saying we want the whole space, y'all move out and we'll move out and figure out something else. But I don't think it will be 100 percent virtual office. I'll make a prediction. You're going to read articles. I already saw one. I think it was Jamie Dimon's. It was Jamie Dimon instead of from Chase. This panacea of, oh, no one's going to go to work. We're all going to be working from our house. It's all going to be lovely. You're going to see lots and lots of stories about they figured out that their occupancy costs were running about six, eight percent in that their efficiencies went down 20 percent. I'm sure there are some businesses. Wow. I'm I'm sure there are some businesses that are going to work just fine from home, maybe computer. I'm not saying for everyone, but I'm sure there's going to be lots of businesses around. They're going to figure out that, yeah, we did save uh, X dollars. But when you look at your big number, it's not rent, it's labor. So if your labor just slips five percent because they're home with the dog or the kid or the mother-in-law or the neighbor that wants to show them the new car or whatever distracts people at home it's not going to take much to all of a sudden find out you know what maybe not a bad thing to pay rent and have everybody in the same room yeah well, I'll, don't I'll, you think, I'll, sorry don't you think there's going to be quite a bit of pushback for people who don't care for the commute because that doesn't show up on the business owner's books the cost um, of the commute yeah I, I, I think it'll be there, Paul. I think you're what I was going to say. You did perfect springboard. Our clients, particularly our church clients, so everybody's like, what's church going to look like after all of this is back to normal, whatever that means. And it's not going to be, will it be virtual church or will it be in person? The answer is going to be yes. So there will like, like before the pandemic, 10% of all Protestant churches in the United States live streamed their worship. Okay. Now 10% don't. Wow. So like, so, I mean, well, that's part of the reason we started the new company. How many new AV tech middle management people are needed all of a sudden? So anyway, um, the answer is not going to be uh, – we surveyed people that have started their online and particularly the ones that receive PPP money. And overwhelmingly, they're like, no, this is here to stay. We're now both and. And I think it's going to be the same with office space. You, you're going to have some people – where, where we used to hold a number of maybe 10% of our workforce could be virtual because of extenuating circumstances. It might grow a little. Uh, and we might have a more flexible work week. Like you can work one day a week from home or, you know, I think it'll be a both and, but I think, and I, and I do agree there's some businesses that'll be fine going all virtual. Ours will not. And I don't think many will when it's all said and done. I think it'll be a both and. And as my kids reminded me the other day, they said, dad, you know, the bad part about Zoom, he said, no, he said, there's never going to be another snow day for school. <laughs> <laughs> so if we if we have to shut down for hurricanes or whatever, we know how to flip the switch and get some productivity at home if we have to. It's interesting. You do see a lot of people going in different directions. I mean, you know, Facebook took a huge commitment of office space in New York City. At the same time, just this week, I think I saw a story about Stripe, which is paying a bonus to employees who move away from cities uh, where they will take a cut in pay, uh, but they get an initial bonus to to do that. So obviously they're betting uh, that the work from home thing is here to stay. You know what? You can even look at the real estate. So in Chicago, the new thing is my kid's trying to sell his one bedroom condo in the city and like the market's dead. And in the suburbs, the houses are flying off the market because between COVID and the social unrest, which I have to tell everyone, 
it's over here. It's fine. There's not picking every day. There's not windows breaking. It was, there was certainly a couple of bad weeks there, but it's all calmed down. These people flew out to the suburbs. And what's going to happen is when the traffic gets back to quote unquote normal, they're going to wake up and go, Oh my God, what did I do? Some of them, because driving into the city every day is a pain in the ass and that's not going to change. I believe many things, most things are going to go back to just like they were. And there will certainly be some things like what you just said, William, with the churches. I'm sure there will be a profound difference with the online stuff, but some stuff is just going to go back to the way it was. I'm, I'm confident of that. Have any of you changed your thinking about your long-term ambitions for your business? Has this had an impact on what you see as the potential for the business? Either do you see more or, or less potential? I think it remains to be seen. In my case, it could easily swing either way. And uh, uh, one of my guiding principles so far in this thing has just been don't don't try to outguess what happens because the reality is arriving at the rate it is, which is different from what I would have predicted. And so that uh, if I'm trying to see two, three years out, it just seems to me to be a lot of scaring myself over things that may not happen. So, you know, either it's Jay's right, we're all going to go back to normal and then people are going to buy conference tables again, or they won't, one or the other. But it just remains to be seen which one it is, and I'll make the decision when I feel like I'm there. I think conference tables are very important, just so you know. <laughs> well, thank you. They are. That's where a lot of stuff is. I want you to think about this when you do the off-site stuff and people are at home. Think of those conversations, just one, throughout the entire year that you were sitting around with three or four people talking about something, and all of a sudden, the magic of the collaboration comes together, and you all figure it out. Hey, wait a second. We should do – yeah, I love – no, we should do it this way, and all of a sudden, you came up with a great idea or you saw something that was wrong with the business. Those things aren't happening. Everybody's at home. I mean, and don't tell me it's going to happen on a phone with four people on the phone. It's not the same thing. So I do believe you can't replace collaborative thinking in a room around a beautiful conference table. It can happen over Zoom. I hear what you're saying, but not as much. Yeah. Anybody else? William, do you think it can happen over Zoom? Oh, well, I mean, Lauren, you're you're asking the wrong guy. My entire faith is built on the idea that Jesus decided he needed to be here in flesh to make a difference. <laughs> so Zoom doesn't work. Otherwise, he would have just zoomed it in. <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess he was the only guy who had Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he could have waited, right? <laughs> Well, there's no arguing with that, William. I think you put that discussion to rest. Let, let, let me ask you about this. Has this affected your relationship with your employees at all? For one thing, has this made any of you more sensitive to anxiety uh, in your employees? I mean, it's, it's always been there. There's been more of it of late for, for all of us, I suspect. Um, is that an issue you're dealing with more? Do you look at it any differently? I definitely have people that are having anxiety and I'm extremely appreciative of the fact whether they're doing it for me, for the company, for themselves or for anyone else that everybody's showing up to work. And I know some of them having, they're dealing with front cu customers or on the front line. And I'm totally appreciative of the fact that everybody's toughing it out and doing what they can do. But it's, it's absolutely an issue because um, I have plenty of employees that are having that have anxiety and we're doing everything we can, but it's it's a problem. When you say it's a problem, uh, how does that manifest itself? Well, I've got one person who's worked with me for many years who who um, is has has been not showing up to work some days because she's got such bad anxiety. And since I've got over 50 employees, I follow, which I would have anyway, the FMLA laws. So it was suggested you should go on FMLA months ago and the person didn't want to. And now family and medical leave. And w w w if someone goes on that, that means you make accommodations for them and you, you know, you work with them. You don't have to pay them while they're on leave, right? No, it, it's more a guarantee that they can come back as my right. understanding. Yes. Yes. So, so here's something you wouldn't know if you weren't on the front line. So the, so then you'd say, Oh, well just go to the doctor and get a note. Going to a doctor, some doctors are getting very sensitive about writing notes like that. So the doctor then says to a person, you really need to go see a specialist. Okay. Oops, the specialist is booked up for two months. 
this is what's going on. These, these, some of these specialists are just overwhelmed and the system can't take all this. So, so, so then you say, well, then why don't you just accommodate them? Well, then you've got a problem with the rest of the employees and violating your company policies of you're either on FMLA or you're not on FMLA. And if you're not on FMLA, what do you do? Throw out your employee handbook about you can't miss X amount of days. It's it's um it's a little bit of a challenge for the HR department. It's not black and white and it's not simple. And uh, it's stuff you wouldn't have seen coming. And for people that don't have 50 employees, it's not as big an issue. But even if you just want to be a responsible boss and you know want to follow FMLA, if you don't have 50 people, it's still an issue. Like how much room can you give people? You got to take care of the customers at some point. So what if that person's only showing? Showing up two days a week out of, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not simple. Has it been an issue for either William or Paul as well? I have one employee who has expressed, uh, so not, not so much a general anxiety, although I think she has some, but it's, it's, it, it's mostly around her personal situation. Absolutely. I've got that also where there's people that just have horrendous situations because of this that have nothing to do with my company, this with their husband, their wife, their family. That's a whole nother subject. They're just in a bad spot because of this whole thing. I forgot about that. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've certainly experienced that myself when, when my family situation became overwhelming. And I think that just off the bat, anybody who's got kids who, who are schooling from home and you're ostensibly being the, the helper and teacher of that, like that's that's a big stress. So I got uh, that, too. My yeah. my daughter-in-law's got, you know, my grandchildren are eight and five and she's at the end of, and she's a, a labor attorney and she's trying to do her job and trying to do with the kids. It's it's a problem all the way around. And the only reason my wife is sane is because my other kid has a baby and she goes over there and babysits four days a week. So she's got something to do because it's keeping her out of the house because it's this is stressful for everybody or most people. So, yeah, it's uh, and unfortunately, the disappointing part is it's September and like we ain't at the end of it. Like <laughs> when's this going to be over? Who knows? Yeah, as a boss, you end up having to think about all these situations for your people. And I think that part of it is then then it gets down to the individual employee. Are they the type to lay that on you or not? Um, I have a company full of woodworkers. It's heavily male. They're not drama people. So they don't tend to bring stress to me. And the one worker I know about who's been more upfront about it is female. So that may just be part of her personality or just the difference between a a very male and very female workplace. I often wonder about this question. Can you guys be friends with your employees? Um, And has this situation had an impact on your thinking about that? William, how about you? I think that answer's changed as the years have gone by and we've grown. You know, we work with a lot of startup organizations, whether it's a new school or church or relief organization or what have you. And it seems like they all start with me and my four buddies started this company or this church or this school. And there comes a point in their growth where I've said to him many times, I've looked at the founder and said, hey, you know what? It's time to move out of the frat house and move into a real house. And we've had to do some of that. So I started with uh, some relatives. I started with some friends. It's grown. And now we're at a different spot. So I think just by our our growth and evolution, my relationship with them is different. The pandemic has put in strong relief for me some real dilemmas. Like, you know, as one leader told me, he said, I don't get paid for all the things on my job description. I get paid to make about four decisions a year no one else wants to make. Right. And that is what I've felt like this year. And some of them been really painful for people. And you ask if I feel um, more aware of of fear or anxiety around our office. I think I feel more aware that I'm not feeling that fear and anxiety and other people are that, that I'm like, look, guys, we're not under persecution. We're, we're not living in a, you know, a place where we're in prison. We're How about not- World War II? Our parent, my parents lived through World War II. Well, and you know, the, you, you take church, for example, a lot of 
pastors who decide to start meeting again. It's like, you know, we're not living in a place where it's illegal. We're not living in a place where you're going to get crucified, you know, like let's get on with it. And, and as the leader of the organization, I have felt a little insensitive. Um, and I don't know whether that insensitivity is I'm out of touch with reality or if the insensitivity is the thing inside me as a leader founder that's called to make the hard decision. Like we are going to reopen our office. I, I faced enormous resistance to that and I can still feel it, but uh, it was the right thing to do. And we did it carefully and it's working out, but, but it's one of those get paid to make four or five decisions. No one else wants to make. And so, so that it, that's a big rabbit trail, Lauren, but it does lead back to, can you be friends? I, to some extent, yes, but the nature of that relationship, I think, has changed as I have had to make decisions that n not everybody else wants to make. Does that, does that make sense? I'm, I'm figuring it out yeah. as I go. You know what? I've been through that whole transition from being by myself to having 110 people, and I can tell you, I, I think you can, but I think it's just like being a parent. Uh, you can be friends with your kids, but you have to be the parent first. And I think you need to be the boss first. And I think I've got key people with me over 20 years. I never have to make that call. They know it. I know it. I'm the, I, they know I, I never have to pull the, the boss card out. And, and if you've got the right kind of people working for you, they don't make you cause they're all with you together. And I can honestly tell you, I can't think of one situation in 20 years with any of these four people where I ever said to myself, boy, that was, that was, they shouldn't have done that or whatever. They're, they're totally with me, but, but yeah, it's a tricky balance. And, uh, uh, there are some people you absolutely can't be friends with at all. That's for sure. I mean, I always, there's work with and there's work for us. The people that are with you are with you and there's people that are work for us that are valuable, but they need to be managed. So, um, I would like to shift the conversation because I feel like we're a little bit in a CEO. Well, wait a minute. I want to answer. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, Paul, please. No, I don't think you can be friends with your employees. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Because it's a different relationship. I mean, first of all, it's got a direction to it. You, you're the boss. You sign the paychecks. You have the ability to say, you know what? I don't ever want to see you in this building again. And, and for any reason, and there's nothing they can do about it. And so, um, I wish we actually had a better word for the employees that have been with us for whatever length of time that you have a great feeling for and that in a different context you might be friends with and that you enjoy seeing every day. I mean, I've got a lot of employees like that, but I wouldn't call them friends. We just need a better word because it's a have different to define relationship. What a friend is. No, I think you have to define what a friend is. You care about them. They care for you. You look out for each other. You help each other out when you need it. I, I, you know, I think in most categories other than, well, I can fire you any day. I think it walks like a duck. It, you know, it sounds like no, a duck. No, no, no. I, I mean, I, in I most cases, I'm not responsible for paying my friends. There's there's too much that's that's unique to an employee relationship that I don't think it. It's just you can call it friends just because if you feel like that, it's just a bad word for it. But there's another aspect to it. I'm curious about. I I know you well enough to know that you don't live an extravagant life. But I'm wondering. Do, is part of this that you think about what your employees see of your life? Would you be hesitant to show up uh, at work in a flashy new car? No, I don't really care what my employees see about my life. There's nothing very shameful in it. Um, wait, wait, wait. Is that to suggest shameful? If you did have a nice house and a big car, that would be shameful because I'm yeah, always Jay, sensitive Do you have a that. nice house and a big car? Then yes, I do. And I'm not shameful about it. It's okay. No, I absolutely hear no, what you're okay. saying. But, but no, no, I absolutely hear what you're saying. Maybe you're right that you can't call it a friend simply because at the end of the day, you're responsible for paying them. And, and that th there's some truth to that, that there's a piece of it that is not the same as being a friend. And I can't argue with that. Yeah, I mean, there's another sense of responsibility for my employees, too, which is that I owe them some kind of future. And, and I don't manage that with my friends. Like my friends have to take care of their own career, their own future, their own opportunities, their own decisions about uh, 
this and that, what resources they, they devote to this. Employees, I'm choosing their health insurance. I'm choosing where they go to work every day. What's your longest term employee? How long? 23 years. Okay. I just, I just want to throw out there just as an example. I hire a 17 year old kid that, that my third employee, second, third employee. And here it is 42 years later and he's 50 seven years old and he's like my little brother and if anything happened to him i would be devastated devastated and and there was a time one time his wife called me a night he didn't come home one night i thought oh my god he might be dead somewhere and i was putting my pants on and i was teary-eyed thinking about he's as close a friend i I hear what you're saying but you know this isn't just an employee either i think we just need a better word for it yeah we just need a better word for it because that's still not a friendship it's it's a it's more like like a uh, like a vassal or something. It, it's a uh, you have this the, yeah. like the liege lord responsibility for the serfs you own or something. No, I mean, that's, there's something to what that's you're an saying. extreme way to put it, but, but it's I'm just saying that there's not it's not a, what we call a friendship. It's it's different, and we just need better words. Well, here's for here's it. a question, Mark. So the person retires. Am I going to see him? Am I going to call him every six months? Am I no? So I I'm not arguing with you. William, I think you suggested that your thinking on this has evolved a little bit. Is that because you've lost friends, people who were friends who were working at the company and, and for one reason or another stopped being friends? Oh, sure. Sure. I had to part ways with my brother in law, who was our first employee. And, you know, everybody's long... first employee is their brother in law. Didn't you know that? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. No, it's just, I mean, you know, and we still do family dinner every week. Lauren, I think I had a. Yeah. kind of a utopian view of being the cool owner and buddies with everyone. And it just doesn't work. Uh, you know, I'm not to the place on the spectrum where it's like officers don't eat with enlisted men. Like I, I, that, that's not me, but the idea that we can all just be cool and get along and have fun like that's no, not really. So you know I, what? if I had to pick one, there's no question if I had to pick a side, I'd say, no, there's no question. I would not want to mislead anybody because I've lived exactly what you've lived through. All of us have. I by no means would want to give the impression of what you're talking about, the utopian. We're all going to be. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So if I had to pick, can you be friends with your employees? I'd have to say no, for sure, if it's black. Well, I think I think where I am now, Jay, is I, rather than being buddies with my employees, I, I'd love it if they like me. I really want him to respect me. I spoke to uh, a pretty good friend of mine this week who's an entrepreneur, and I hadn't been in touch with him in a couple of months. Turns out he got COVID. He spent a couple of weeks in an ICU and had it pretty bad. Um, and it was an interesting experience for him in terms of running a business from an ICU. I'm curious if any of the three of you have thought about that. Do you know what would happen if you were incapacitated for a period of time? Yes. Tell us. Uh, it's written down. It's in a drawer here. It's our emergency succession plan. We insist that everyone in our company have a plan for what happens if they can't be here for a while. It's kind of we since when you write the book on succession, you kind of have to have a plan yourself. Can you copy that and send it to me so I can use it? <laughs> well, I, that, it, wouldn't that be great if there were a cookie cutter for succession? There is no cookie cutter. Yeah, I got to say, if it would depend on what the nature of it was. But uh, if I was unconscious for a month, that would be pretty bad for the business. I haven't. I don't even have a plan for that because there's so much. Well, you, then you the need terms one, of. I mean, we have one if the president becomes incapacitated, you know, I mean, it, you need one. Paul, yeah, do you, it's mostly do you about not, check signing authority. Do you not think that your some of your employees already think there's times where you're unconscious for a month? You don't think that? Because I'm sure mine do. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, don't th- I don't think that in my case, Jay, because I'm here snooping around every day. Yeah. William, what's the first step? How does someone like Paul go about putting a plan like that in place? Well, I think it's actually the easiest first step toward a real succession plan, which all of us are just interim owners or interim leaders, right? And and it No, nope, no, nope, no, nope, I mean, not necessarily right. Some of us think if we drop dead, maybe the business will be over and maybe that's okay. No, that still makes you an interim. I mean, okay, either it ends or the world ends or someone's gonna follow you. 
whether you sell to another company or another leader comes in or you let your kid run it or whatever. No, the thing you could is. just shut the people shut businesses down. 70%. That's right. Just shut That's down. A, that, fair point. Fair point. That's so if you want to, if you want to, and by closing, then that's one way. Otherwise, there needs to be a plan for the future. And the easiest task to get that going is to say, well, what would happen if I couldn't be here for six months or three months? And so we tell people, identify the key uh, deliverables that you are doing that no one else can do right now. Check signing authority is a great example of one of a, a long list. And where would you then delegate that out if you had to? And you say, well, I can't delegate that. Well, then I guess the options close the business. You know, that's funny you bring up check signing because I didn't sign checks for years and now I'm signing them every single week. And you know what? I screwed up. I should have stayed signing the checks. I totally I, agree. Made the same I, mistake. Why was it a mistake to stop? Because I probably have a thousand checks a month and going out. I got, you know, I got all these little vendors. I'm, and because, because once in a while you see a check and you think, wow, we're spending a lot of money for blankety blank. Paul, is this giving you pause? Is there a way that you could divide up your duties and make a plan? I could. The financial things would probably be the trickiest because, well, there's there's a number of duties. I mean, we're only a 20-person company, so uh, there's a number of things like insurance renewals and various licensing and, and state interaction issues and health buying health insurance, and there's stuff that I just do. I could make a plan. Uh, it would be almost like my wife and I talk about paying the bills. Like I pay the bills every month and the plan is she should pay the bills. But uh, to let her pay the bills while I watch for six months <laughs> would drive me insane. So I'm sort of like trying to figure out how I would do that in the similar thing in, in the business. And uh, William, do you actually let someone take the wheel for a while and do it and, yeah, and execute I the plan? I do. In many iterations of our business, I would not have been able to say that. One time I thought I was doing that and the, the competency that I thought was there was not. So I had to take things back over. But um, yeah, they actually execute the plan. My, my job right now, and it'll probably change over the years, is kind of like uh, if, we're a, if we're an old sailboat, an old three-masted you know, explorer ship, whatever, I'm in the crow's nest looking for the next horizon. And then I look down to the guy at the wheel and say, I see where we need to go. And he says, I know how to get there. That's, that's the most pedestrian way to describe uh, uh, how it's set up right now. I will tell you an answer that I'm not being flip when I say this at all for people that own businesses that have a spouse that's not involved and they're worried what happens if I drop dead, what's going to happen to the business. And I'm I'm a big proponent of have a good life insurance policy, because at the end of yes. the day, I don't care what your plan is and who you think's taken over. We've all seen it. I think we've all seen it. I certainly have seen it. It might not work. And I don't want to leave my my wife or yes. uh, hanging out there. And life insurance is still pretty cheap. It is cheap. I just to give you an example, I'm 64 years old. I, I'm about to take out a million dollar mortgage on something. I can buy a 10 year policy for forty eight hundred bucks for for, for thirty nine hundred bucks for a million dollars. So like it's still not expensive, even at my age. So like people are probably underinsured that owed businesses because at the end of the day, it would sure be nice to know that if all your plans didn't work out, nobody's going to starve. Well, I, I've got life insurance, and, and if I died, that would actually not be nearly as big a problem as if I was in a coma. <laughs> right. Which so maybe means... the plan would be if, if I'm in a coma, just put the pillow over my face. Well, that's a given. <laughs> Didn't you? And... Don't you have that deal with somebody? That's a given. You know, then then you've got a couple of million bucks to play with to shut the business down and, and retire. I just don't have anybody who I believe is capable of doing all the things that I do. Then Am that's, I, your, then that's your problem. No, I'm saying he doesn't have a problem. Right. He's at the size business that the owner is running people. the business. Yeah, no, I, I don't think that is a problem. Do. It's not worth having that person. It would cost them too much. And all of a sudden, is in, I don't think there's a problem there. Is Jay right about that, Paul? Yeah, yeah I mean, I've been I there. think that it's like the cost of, of having and training someone would probably be half your income. probably some form of insurance policy I could buy. I mean, I don't know. I'm going to get I'm going to think about it because at least leaving a playbook like here's what I actually have to do during the course of the year. In January, you better do this. And in February, you better do that. There you um, go. There that would go. be a start. And yes. 
At the end of the day, if you got run over by a bus, the only way that probably would be working is if your wife could sell the business for 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 a decent money, because I don't think one of your employees is going to step up and take over the business unless you think your wife can, which certainly happens. My to- wife has many virtues, but I don't think she's going to be right. Running which this which means this instruction plan should be how to sell the business. Um, well, I would be very curious if William, if you were willing to share it. Uh, to see what yours looks like. I mean, is it more about day-to-day operations or more about some grand, here's the, here's the, like the, the, the airline thing where you pull it and you see how the slides go out the airplane. Like, how do we get out right, of this? Right, we right. need to. Uh, it's, um, it's a little, it's a little bit of both and it's evolved every year. I, I, you know, I used to have one in place where this person would take over everything external, like sales and marketing, and this person would take over operations and execution of work. Uh, now it goes much more to the COO, and then there's a, well, what if he had been around? Um, for a while, it was Adrian would run everything, but then what if we're in the same airplane and we both go down? Or you know, So I, I could share it, but it's not helpful. The worst, the worst thing you can do is copy someone else's succession plan. It just doesn't work, especially how, if you're the founder. Or how, how about this? Like if, if, if uh if my father dies, he designated my brother as executor. Like, does anybody know of a situation where you have a person who's actually not in the company day to day, but is just willing to step in as a leader and you say, okay, yes, call this guy. Yes. I mean, yes. is that a, is it's, that a thing? Do you pay people for that? It is. It, well, for me, it is a thing. Uh, but it's like, uh, if you remember when Reagan got shot and Al Haig said, I'm in charge. Right. Um, <laughs> so it's about fifth down the food chain of things that happen. Like if this and this and this are not in place, then you actually call my brother, who's executor of our state, and uh, uh, he, he he then takes over. So I think it is naive, and the math would back me up on this, to think that if any of us drop dead, we can leave an instruction sheet, and then someone's just going to run our businesses for us. I think the math says it. 66% of businesses don't get to the second generation. I think what we do is is a little more complicated than that, and um, my guess is our spouses would sell the business. Well, I, I agree with your statistics. I disagree with your diagnosis of my business. My annual review is a one-question, pass-fail review. This year, did you make yourself less necessary to the growth and running of this business? And so, there's only one right answer. Every single year, I remove my essential presence a little bit more. I, me too. And I, I do very little day-to-day stuff. My question is, so if you disappear tomorrow... That business is still around in 10 years doing fine? I don't know if the business is around 10 years from now, one way or the other. But yeah, I think well, it that's has kind of my point. A, I think it has as good a chance as it does with me. Boy, I think you underestimate yourself tremendously. Yeah, okay. you're, being, you're being humble. It's You're being extremely humble, and I don't believe that for a second because I've been on this thing with you many times. You're very smart, and you're very intuitive, and you've made really great decisions. And I suggest to you that thinking one of the people that either work for you is just going to step in and all of a sudden do what you do, you just said it yourself. You make four decisions a year that no one else wants to make. Mm. So, it, it, but, but Jay, like, so what? So he has the plan. Are you suggesting he now take the plan and throw it away? No, not at all. Give it a good shot. But I'm suggesting um, uh, as important a plan would be to your wife. If something happens to me, here's the thinking. And I've, and I've done this. I do have a sheet. And I've told my three kids. I have three adult sons. I made it clear to all of them. Here's some ideas as to what to do. But if, when I'm gone, do what you got to do. Don't don't go ahead. And if you decide the business is shot and it's done, don't 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 torture yourself with, oh, my God, dad's turning in his grave. It'll be fine. Do what you got to do. If they decide that they don't want to run it and they can't sell it, closing the business would not be the end of the world. Torturing my kids, which I've seen. I've been in business groups for years with these these people that took over the family business. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy where the kid mm-hmm. gets hung around the neck with the business they never wanted to be in. It is a horrible thing to do to your children or your wife. So I don't want to do that. So I think it's, succession plan is great. I just think the other plan should be. Here's some other options. Here's how you should sell the business. Here's what I would talk to to sell the business. Here's what I would try to, you know, I think that's smart. We're out of time here today. This was a really interesting conversation as always. Thank you, Paul Downs, Jay Galtz, and William Vanderbloon. Thanks for listening, everybody. 
This episode was produced by Jess Thubaran, founder of Blank Word Productions. Remember, we started the 21 Hats podcast to help business owners feel a little less isolated, to let them know they aren't the only ones fighting these battles. If you got something out of this conversation, please help us reach more people. Tell a friend, subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at 21 underscore hats. And let me know if you have a question or a comment or a topic you'd like us to cover. My email address is lfeldman at 21hats.com. See you next time.